Hi there, thank you for joining uh, the um, final event of the Cafe Culture series. Cafe Culture is a consortium based in the northeast of England. Um, we put on events um, that discuss philosophy, arts and culture, science and politics. So this final event of our autumn series is one of the philosophy events. So it's in collaboration with the Newcastle Philosophy Society and the Philosopher um, Public Philosophy Journal that also runs another series. That's the latest issue. Um, I will be putting up links to, um, to Cafe Culture, to the speakers and various things in the chat function as we go through. So to turn to the event today, I'm delighted that we're able to have a conversation between two early modern philosophy scholars, Beth Lord and Chris Maines. Um, the topic, as I'm sure you will know, is Spinoza in the Anthropocene. And while Beth was quick to assure me that she's not a um, straight up expert on the Anthropocene, she certainly found a really interesting way of bringing Spinoza into dialogue with some central concerns related to the climate crisis. Um, so much of Beth and Chris's discussion will revolve around an essay that Beth published earlier this year for E.ON, the online magazine. I'll put a link to that. So just to introduce our speakers, Beth Lord is a philosopher based at the University of Aberdeen. Um, she specializes in the history of philosophy, especially the work and influence of Immanuel Kant and Baruch, Baruch Spinoza, and um, also on um, continental or modern European philosophy. And um, Beth will be joined today by Chris Maines, who is a philosopher and historian of science working as a postdoctoral researcher at Uppsala University. Chris is currently working on two books that are going to be published next year. One is called Philosophical Empires, which is co-written with Adam Ferner, who some of you may remember from a previous event. And the second one is information and the history of philosophy. So I think I've probably said everything by way of information in terms of basic things. Um, Beth and Chris will be in conversation for probably around half an hour. Um, please uh, send any questions you may have for them using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens. And if you want to say hello to us, um, tell us where you're from, where you are in the world, whether it's morning, afternoon or evening, um, then send that to the chat thing. So I think I've said everything. So hopefully Beth and Chris will magically appear on your screens and we can start the event. So thanks both very much to you and I'm really looking forward to this. Thank you, Anthony, for the introduction. Um, hi, Beth. Hi, Chris. Very good to talk to you. Um, I made myself a cup of tea. I hope you are comfortable and I hope everyone else in the call is comfortable. Um, so the topic we decided on for this meeting was um, in response to your work on Spinoza and the Anthropocene. And um, specifically, we decided to focus on one aspect that's happening in this current era, namely on um, the climate emergency, so yeah, um, which is happening right now. And I think just to start us off, um, what I wanted to ask you is the climate emergency is very alive to us right now in 2020. So we are noticing already the global heating, species going extinct, ice caps melting. We are very aware of it. Uh, Spinoza lived in the 17th century. so. He didn't write on it and maybe he didn't even foresee that anything like this would ever happen. So I wanted to ask you, um, what got you thinking about linking this 17th century philosopher with this very urgent uh, topic for us today? Yeah, I guess there's sort of two main points that got me interested in thinking about this topic. Um, as you say, Spinoza was writing in the 17th century. He, he's not conscious of something called the Anthropocene. And right. yet, Spinoza is a philosopher of the Anthropocene period. So his major work, The Ethics, is written in the 1660s. It's written in Amsterdam. Um, Spinoza is very much writing in the golden age of 
Dutch society, the dawn of capitalism. And we can see his work as being positioned between the scientific revolution, which starts with Galileo and other thinkers, and the industrial revolution, which is just about to get going in, in the early 18th century, about, about 40 years after Spinoza's death. So Spinoza actually occupies this really interesting position as, as being mm -hmm. a member of the early Anthropocene. And, and so there's something interesting about thinking about his work in that context. But the key idea from Spinoza that I think is relevant here is Spinoza's naturalism. And that really challenges how we think about the Anthropocene and the climate emergency. Um, as some of you may know, Spinoza is a monist. Um, he believes that all of being um, is one being. And that one being is called God or nature. So there's just, just one being in the universe. Everything is part of that one being and that one being is God or nature. And I'll, I'll refer to that as God or nature throughout, throughout my references to it. So individual things like human beings and objects and animals and plants, we're not independent substances, rather we're the changing modes or ways of being of God or nature. I sometimes like to think of individuals as the surface fluctuations, the sort of waves on the surface of mm -hmm. one substance. And everything is part of nature. And that means that we too are part of nature. We are part of God or nature. So what that means is that nature is not something over there that we do things to. Yeah. Um, our actions are in fact expressions of nature. We, we and our actions just are parts of nature. And that nicely complicates how we see climate change. Um, because the mm -hmm. transformations of the earth that are caused by human beings understood in a different way can be understood as nature transforming itself. Yeah. So I guess an interesting question for me is if we hold to Spinoza's naturalism, how does that change how we think and feel about the events of the Anthropocene and the climate? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and I think, one of the things that I got from your work was also this idea that if you say, hey, um, the situation we find ourselves in, so species going extinct, it is just nature transforming. Um, is it really a bad thing? So does Spinoza see this as a bad thing that's happening right now? Or um, might it not be bad at all if it's just a transformation? Right, and that, that's one of the really interesting questions. Um, so Spinoza thinks that we can take these two different perspectives on events. Mm -hmm. um, we can take a human perspective on events where we think about things that have happened based on our own experience and our feelings and on the rational knowledge that we've been able to build up. Um, and from that human perspective, we evaluate things as being good or bad, depending on what's useful for us and our survival mm -hmm. and our flourishing and what's less useful or what's actually yeah. um, destructive for our, um, for our uh, survival and our flourishing. Um, so from a strictly human perspective, actions mm -hmm. that contribute um, to human knowledge and power are good because they're good for us. So the actions of the Anthropocene, um, such as extracting fossil fuels, yeah. depleting natural resources, that's actually good from a human perspective, or at least it has been good um, yeah, it's, because it's enabled us to build up our knowledge and our, our science and our, our expertise and our power at, at surviving and becoming healthier and, and more knowledgeable human beings. Um, however, <laughs> there's also another perspective we can take, and that's the perspective of God or nature itself. Um, and when we take that perspective, we, we sort of take the point of view of eternity. Now, that's not a point of view that we take naturally. It's, it's not kind of normal for us to think from, from the perspective of eternity. But Spinoza thinks that as we understand more and more about ourselves, about our connectedness to the rest of nature, um, we increasingly take that perspective. So what it is to become wise human beings is to take that perspective of eternity. And from the perspective of eternity, there are no mm -hmm. values of good or bad. Um, God or nature is an infinite being that necessarily exists. Everything that happens, um, whether it's good or bad from our perspective, is just part of nature. So it just is what it is. Yeah. Um, and God or nature can really take on infinite configurations and places no particular value on which configuration of nature it takes on at, at any um, given time. So from the perspective of eternity, the Anthropocene mm -hmm. and climate change are, are just minor blips. <laughs> They're just yeah. different configurations of a nature that's in constant change. Um, and from the perspective of God, Spinoza's view is that God is indifferent. It's, this is neither mm -hmm. good nor bad from, from that perspective. Mm -hmm. 
I always have this when thinking about Spinoza, then once you really start getting into the view, it's just mind blowing for me um, that you start taking on, try to take on this perspective of eternity, but I don't think I ever succeed in it while trying. Um, can I ask you a bit more about these um, several perspectives? Because um, you mentioned the human perspective and um, that from the human perspective, it could be good to extract natural uh, resources and to do all kinds of things which cause uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Is that, um, how far does that perspective reach? So is it just for me during my lifespan or is it also for say my family um, and my children maybe? So how far does that human perspective uh, reach for Spinoza? Yeah, good question. Um, so, I mean, initially every, every being for Spinoza is, is driven by the need and the striving to persevere in its own being. So it mm -hmm. starts from just being about you, being about yeah, your, own, okay. your own striving. But something that's very important to Spinoza is our um, our relationship to others. And he recognizes okay. that our striving to go on being what we are is heavily interdetermined with, with the being of others and, and with the being of the environment. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so it very quickly becomes a, a, much, a much bigger story. So okay. One of the key themes of Spinoza's ethics is that as we gain knowledge, as we become more rational, as we understand our nature more, we understand what it is to be human more and more. Mm -hmm. And that means that we're able to come together with other human beings to work together, to understand together, and um, ultimately to, to be better human beings together. So, um, so it's kind of both at the same time. It's both. It's both about what's good for me. But as I become more rational, I understand yeah. actually about what's good for everybody. Right. So just to go back to the Anthropocene for a minute. Yeah. Um, as again, I mean, it, it it seems to us, or it has seemed to us, perhaps for the last four hundred years, that the actions of the Anthropocene, extracting fossil fuels, depleting natural resources, has been really good for human beings because it's enabled us to to build up our 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 science our technology our industries our wealth mm -hmm. our, our power and our health but as our nature and sorry as our understanding gets more yeah. and more advanced um we come to understand that actually a lot of these developments are really bad for human beings mm -hmm, uh, it's mm -hmm. really bad for us to destroy ecosystems um it's really bad for us to to cut down the amazon rainforest and to allow the um the, the ice caps to melt. Um, why is it bad? Well, it's not it's not bad because it's bad for nature, as we've seen already. It's neither right. good nor bad from a natural perspective. It's bad because it's bad for us. If okay. the ice caps melt, um, huge numbers of human beings are going to be underwater. Yeah. Uh, if the Amazon is burned down, then um, the natural cooling system on the Earth is is going to collapse. So we're going to see cascading disasters, which yeah. which will so, be bad for human life everywhere. So would it be correct to say that even when you stay in this human perspective, as your considerations of both time span and say the regions that you consider as they broaden, you can even within this human perspective get this flip of, well, short term thinking, it seems good for whoever benefits from it. But if you expand it, you actually see that it's bad for us. Um, so you get this yeah. flip in the judgment. Okay. So one way of thinking about it is in terms of a short term perspective versus a yeah. long term. Another way of thinking about it is to think that while well, human knowledge develops over time, we now have yeah. the benefit of much more complex scientific knowledge than was available in the 17th True. century or the 18th century or 19th century for that matter. Yeah. Um, so, so we have access to a, to a level of understanding now that people of Spinoza's era simply didn't have. And mm -hmm. ironically, that's thanks to the Anthropocene. <laughs> Without the Anthropocene, <laughs> we wouldn't have the science to tell us what's, what's going on. Mm -hmm. So, um, so as we develop this this knowledge for Spinoza, we we also develop our understanding of what's truly good for human beings, um, mm -hmm. and that so that understanding changes. What was good for us in 1660 is not what's good for us now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um... One other thing, yeah, if, if we move on in these different perspectives, uh, if uh, you compare the human perspective and the um, infinity or the eternal perspective, would it be correct to say that the eternal perspective, that's always the correct one? So we think, uh, and we can get this switch of, okay, it seems good or it, it might seem bad, but um, 
if you consider it from this perspective of infinity or eternity, that's always the correct perspective. Um, well, the, the term correct is, is kind of relative. Okay. So, um, <laughs> So yeah, I mean, from a from a kind of absolute God's eye perspective, of sure. course, it's ultimately true that um, nothing is really and truly and absolutely good or bad in right, in us, right? Because because for God or substance, nothing is is good or bad. But we shouldn't conclude from that that nothing is good or bad for us. Yeah, um, okay. What what we judge to be good or bad for us is absolutely essential to to being human and absolutely essential to how we live our lives, the decisions we make, um, the paths we take, um, and, and how, how, we, how we decide to go forward as a species. So, um, so it's, it's not wrong to say <laughs> that climate change is bad for us. Okay. Um, it's right, in fact, just to say that it's bad for us. Yeah. Um, so it, so it's, it's essential that we sort of know what perspective we're in, I suppose, okay. when, we're, when we're thinking yeah. about what's ultimately true. Perfect, so always clarify the perspective you're working with. Um, so in uh, some of the work you, that you produced um, around this topic, one of the things you also stressed that Spinoza can help us with is this uh, topic of emotions and how we emotionally respond. I mean, for me, it's often despair <laughs> um, to uh, the realization of this impending uh, climate emergency. So I wanted to see if we can now shift to this topic of emotions, because I think it's quite relevant. Um, and because I'm now based in Sweden, I wanted to throw in Greta Thunberg, <laughs> if that's all right. So I got two quotes um, from Greta Thunberg's speeches, uh, where she, these themes of emotions come up also um, very frequently. And one of the emotions that she brings in is panic. Uh, someone point, uh, she says, um, my name is Greta Thunberg. I'm 16 years old. I come from Sweden and I want you to panic. And then she clarifies, when your house is on fire and you want to keep your house from burning to the ground, then that does require a level of panic. And a second emotion that she often brings in is that of hope. And here's one quote where she responds to people who say, well, the next generation, they give us so much hope and we really hope that you're going to save everything. And there she says, saying that everything will be all right while continuing doing nothing at all is just not hopeful to us. In fact, it's the opposite of hope. You can't just sit around and waiting for hope to come. And in, I just wanted to put this to you. So what would Spinoza say about um, these specific emotions of hope and um, panic and hope? I think he speaks specifically of fear. I think that that comes close. So what, yeah. what would you think of these attitudes? So Spinoza has a lot to say about the emotions. Um, mm -hmm. All of part three of the ethics, his major work, is, mm -hmm. is dedicated to, to looking at what he calls the passions, yeah. uh, what we would call emotions or feelings. Um, and Spinoza thinks that emotions are inevitable. They're a part of nature. They're a part of they're a part of being human, a part of being any any kind of uh, finite being. But emotions are tied to what he calls inadequate knowledge. So that's okay. the sort of haphazard knowledge that we get from experience, feelings, hearsay, the bits and pieces that we pick up day to day. All of those are bits of knowledge are kind of tied up with emotion for us, he thinks. Um, and in general, Spinoza thinks emotions obstruct our rational thinking. Okay. Um, and they're not the right starting point for dealing with a problem. And negative emotions are particularly bad because they diminish our power to act. Spinoza thinks negative emotions like sadness, pain, despair, guilt, fear, those diminish our being so that we, we actually let, we, we become sort of physically and mentally depressed. We're, we're unable mm -hmm. to, to act or to think. Now, hope and fear are particularly interesting. Um, I'm taking panic here as, as a kind yeah. of thing. Hope and fear are really interesting emotions for Spinoza because these are emotions of vacillation about the future. When mm -hmm. we don't know what's going to happen, we oscillate between feeling positive and negative about the future. Or, as Spinoza puts it, we oscillate between feeling hope and fear. And in fact, for Spinoza, hope and fear are two sides of the same coin. Okay. People who feel hopeful can very easily be made to feel fearful and vice versa. And so Spinoza recognizes that these emotions are very often used as political tools. Mm. So to come back to Greta Thunberg, I think that Spinoza would absolutely understand the value of the instrumental use of hope. And fear. Okay. He would see that 
that what's going on there is 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 something that's that's needed in order to capitalize on people's feelings of uncertainty about the future because those feelings are there and if we can use those feelings to galvanize people to follow certain leaders or certain rules then hope and fear can be really useful in that sense but ultimately, he would say that hope and fear don't really help us to understand our circumstances mm -hmm. or to solve problems. Um, for that, he thinks we need to overcome our feelings and build up our rational knowledge. Uh, so the idea is that, just <laughs> if I can rephrase to, uh, to get it um, correctly. So they are... Um, not really contributing to understanding uh, of the situation, but uh, they can spur us into action. Uh, is that the idea, or we, it allow it allows us to be manipulated by others to be spurred into action? Exactly, and and that manipulation. I mean, manipulation is a kind of negative word, but manipulation yeah. can be a good thing. <laughs> Sometimes right. you need to manipulate people in order to get them to do the right thing. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and and hope and fear. I think. Those of things certainly can be used in those kinds mm -hmm. of ways. He's mm -hmm. very interested in the political uses of those emotions. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, they can be used in really negative and worrying ways, yeah. but they can also be used in positive ways. And here maybe is an example where 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 we do need yeah. them. But I only as a starting point, not as right. not as a sort of permanent state that we should be in. Right, because there might be the risk that you're just becoming a puppet and you don't really grasp the, the actual situation behind your actions. Yeah. Cool. Um, speaking of action and making a difference or not making a difference, so one element which um, I think you may have flagged when introducing Spinoza, but um, maybe it was more in the background, was this idea that uh, Spinoza thinks that actually all of the human act, because we're just transformations of nature, um, all of the actions that humans do are actually already determined. So there's no freedom for us to act in one way or another. Um, and I think that thought is for many people will also be tied up with a lot of emotions. Um, you might feel completely paralyzed if you think, well, I can't really make a difference or something or everything is already uh, determined or that you get either despair because you don't you can't really change anything or precisely feel liberated because you think well it's not up to me or something um uh, how can you maybe say something about um in spinoza's thinking is it is it the case that climate change is either uh, uh sorry the um, mass extinction is either unavoidable or um it's precisely going to be avoided. Uh, can you say something about how this idea of determinism or necessity fits in here? Yeah, so again, this is a really big theme in Spinoza's thought. Mm -hmm. um, so part of his belief that all of being is one being is the belief yeah. that, that being is, is fully determined, that it's what happens is fully necessitated to happen. Um, so I think, I think one way into this topic is to think about the distinction between determinism on the one hand and predeterminism on the other. Okay. So predeterminism is the view that God has a plan for us, which is known in advance and which cannot be changed. It's like the ancient yeah. idea of fate. So, you know, Oedipus will kill his father no matter what he does to try to avoid that outcome. That's, yeah. that's the idea of predetermination. Um, determinism, on the other hand, um, means that every event can be fully explained through natural causes. Good. And probably most of us believe in determinism on that level. Um, but for Spinoza, what it means is that all events, all actions, and all causes are simply parts of God or nature. Okay. So it really does follow directly from his, from his naturalism. So when Spinoza denies that we have free will, he denies that there's a special part of the human mind that could act or make choices independently of that natural causation. And if you right. think about it, that, that really does follow very straightforwardly because if everything is part of God or nature, yeah. there can't be any part of us that, that isn't part of, of, that, of that nature. So, um, so really what he's denying is that there's this special human free will okay. that, that kind of is able to act outside of that system. He does not deny that we make choices or that we act. Good. Of course we make choices. We make choices all the time. Um, we, we act, we, we decide how to choose and how, how to act. 
And in fact, we think of ourselves as free when we when we make those choices. Now, mm -hmm. it, it's false. We're not really free, but yeah. it's perfectly natural and normal that we think of ourselves in that way. So a, a nice metaphor for thinking about this is to think of our actions or our decisions as being on the surface of a swirling mass of the infinite causal interactions of the universe. <laughs> okay. And our actions emerge from that swirling mass, but they're also part of that swirling mass and they have effects on other actions and events. So what happens to us depends on what's going on in that swirling mass and how mm -hmm. we interact with it. Yeah. And how we interact with it is partly determined by what we think and what we decide, which is yeah. in turn determined by other factors. So, yeah. um, so that's that's one. Uh, maybe some people find that image helpful, and others probably don't. No, absolutely. And that's one way to sort of think about it. Is it's just that we're we're just part of this mass of causal events, and and what we think of as free choices and free decisions, um, is is really. Yeah, there isn't there isn't this this element of oh now something spont completely spontaneous, inexplicable by nature is happening. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah perfect. So re returning to the question of how we should think about our, you know, about climate change and whether we just give up and say, oh, well, yeah, nothing absolutely. Um, Spinoza thinks that resigning ourselves to fate is one of the worst things we can do, because if we do yeah. that, then we just stop thinking and we just yeah. effectively we are allowing other forces of nature to completely determine our actions for us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I give up. I'm not going to make any decisions. I'm not going to think for myself. I'm just going to let what happens happen. That's just giving yourself up to the, yeah. to the various forces of nature, which are going to push you one way or another. So instead, what we need to do is think carefully about how we're part of nature, how we interact with other forces and actors in nature, how we play a role in that swirling mass of events. And we act most effectively for our own flourishing if we clearly understand our connections to other things. Perfect. Um, and also it would be very essential if our political leaders were more aware of that and actually making those decisions. Um, as a last question that I would like to put to you is um, about precisely that point of the way forward. So if we were to spin ask Spinoza, okay, what next? How do we get out of this? Um, uh, I think one of the suggestions that you highlighted in your work is that Spinoza would see a way out in, well, not, he hasn't reflected on this question, but were this to be put on uh, to him, um, that he would think uh, legislation uh, to, invite people, encourage people to take the right action uh, would be very important. And um, I can definitely see that. Um, but what also occurred to me was that at least in the last couple of decades, um, we've seen a lot of uh, awareness and um, action generated from people who are precisely challenging the current legal status quo. Uh, so I'm thinking of, for example, Extinction Rebellion protests and Greta Thunberg, who was skipping school in order to really make this point. Um, what would Spinoza say about this? Um, so you say civil disobedience and um, is it okay if you, you really, if the cause is really serious or should we really stick to the legislation and get everyone to join uh, through that route? Yeah. Um, well, as, as we've seen through the discussion, knowing what's good for us is really difficult, right? Mm -hmm. we, need, we need to have a lot of knowledge of ourselves and our position in, in the world. Spinoza thinks we need to understand quite a lot about metaphysics and, and mm -hmm. physics and, and, and lots of other things besides. Um, we need to rationally understand ourselves, our relations to other things as part of nature, uh, so that we figure out what's truly good for human flourishing and what we should mm -hmm. do in our lives. Um, but rational understanding like that is really hard to achieve and yes. it's also unstable for Spinoza. It's okay. not the case that if we get some rational knowledge, we, we somehow magically hang on to it. It's really vulnerable to being um, taken apart. And I mean, we, we, we've seen lots of examples of that really recently in our history where, where you know, we thought we had a, a solid shared basis of rational understanding mm -hmm. and, and certain political leaders or certain actors or movements can, can mm -hmm. just destroy that or, or undermine it. Right. So reason, rational knowledge is vulnerable to those things. It's vulnerable to emotions. It's vulnerable to being crowded out by erroneous beliefs or bad leaders. Many people won't develop rational understanding at all. So for Spinoza, what that means is that societies need laws. They need legislation. Yeah. 
that tells people how to behave and what's good for them. And Spinoza has quite a lot to say about this in his political text. So ideally, laws would be based on sound reasoning. They'd be based on what's truly good for us, hopefully devised by a rational council of thinkers who have really <laughs> understood what, what's going on with human nature. But of course, he's also realistic and he knows that that's often not the case. Laws are all too often based in superstition. They're based in tradition. They're based on the desire to repress others sometimes or to maintain a status quo that benefits the powerful. And in these cases, we might think of ourselves as justified in breaking the law or challenging it if we think that we have that rational understanding of what's good um, mm -hmm. and we think we know, we think we know better. Um, Spinoza is quite cautious about that. Okay. Um, he lived, of course, in a pol politically highly precarious time yeah. when really any rule of law was preferable to the lawless alternative. And the lawless alternative was always kind of hanging on the horizon mm. for, for thinkers like Spinoza and Hobbes. Um, so Spinoza tends to be against civil disobedience. Um, but if we think about some of the things that um, Thunberg and Extinction Rebellion are doing, um, yeah. Spinoza recognizes the power of performance and the power of narrative and the power oh. of storytelling to spur people to think, to um, get people to believe in narratives which can make them act well. Um, so I want to sort of go both ways here, a bit like I did on the Greta Thunberg question. Um, on the one hand, Spinoza thinks that real change rests with everybody mm -hmm. thinking rationally and discussing rationally together with good leadership. But he's also realistic and he knows that, that emotions, stories, performances, these things are really important in, in getting people to think in the right kinds of ways and, mm -hmm. and, and to forge change in that way. So, right. so there would be room in Spinoza's thinking for, for at least some of those kinds of actions. Right, and then those actions could be like the starting point for other people to increase their understanding and then maybe enforce the, um, or legislate in the right way. Right. Good, um, thank you so much. I am now going to try to see if we can open it up for questions. So um, I've worked a lot with Zoom, but the Q&A function is new to me. Um, so I am going to go through it and see if I can pick one which is suitable at the moment. So some people said the questions have been answered. Um, so um, here's a question um, from uh, Peter Orr who uh, asks if you would be happy to say something about how to interpret Spinoza's ethics in the context of the intrinsic value of nature in itself, rather than value from a human perspective. Um, so is there something uh, for Spinoza of the idea that nature, or maybe the environment, um, that they have intrinsic value? Uh, or... Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So again, for Spinoza, the question is always value from whose perspective? <laughs> so from nature's own perspective, there, there is no value. Nature doesn't value itself, if you like. Um, so I guess the important question is, um, should humans think that nature has an intrinsic value? Um, and I, I think the answer is yes. And I'm, I'm saying that almost against Spinoza himself. <laughs> Some of you who are familiar with Spinoza might, might realize that Spinoza is, is very much a thinker of his time insofar as he thinks that nature is available for human beings to do what they like with. <laughs> So he has these certain passages where he says, you know, plants and animals, they're there for us to use. We can use them as we wish. We're not required to think about animals' feelings or, you know, or, or think of them mm -hmm. as having any intrinsic value or, or anything like that. Um, but I think that if Spinoza were alive today, he would realize that that's, that's not right. Um, and, mm -hmm. that, and that actually we, we do need to, to, to think of um, the lives of animals and the sustenance of ecosystems as, as being absolutely essential to human flourishing. Okay. Again, that knowledge just wasn't available in the sense. Right. It wasn't the way people thought. It, it wasn't part of the part of what people understood. But now we do understand that. And 
Um, and I think, but I like to think that Spinoza would be um, magnanimous enough to change his thinking. <laughs> but, yeah, so we actually get Spinoza's view for 2020. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, it, but for him, it's, it's just based on 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 solid thinking. Um, mm, yeah. we, we, we need to think, okay, what's good for us? Um, well, what's good for us is, is that is that nature continues to sustain us and, and enable us to live healthy, yeah. balanced lives. And, and that's only possible if, if, if we value um, other beings in nature and other systems in nature. Perfect. Um, here's another question from uh, Shastin Andermann, who says, um, who asks, do you think that Anthropocene is the right term in a Spinozian perspective? Or do you think he could have imagined he could have even imagined such a central position uh, for humans in his whole system of nature. Great question. Hi, Kristen. Nice to hear from you. Um, I do think it's the right term. Um, so in, in the appendix to part one of the ethics, Spinoza has a long section where he sets out his anti-anthropocentrism. Um, Spinoza is very clear that nature is not designed for human benefit. Um, that uh, God doesn't favor human beings over any other kinds of beings. Um, this is all part of God's uh, valuelessness and his, oh, sorry, not his, it's indifference to, to, uh, to, to the, the different configurations that nature takes on. Um, and he also talks, Spinoza talks a lot in that section about why it is that human beings think of themselves as being the center of the universe. What, how this, what he calls a prejudice, this human prejudice comes about that we think of ourselves as being all important, as being the purpose of creation and so on. So I think that Spinoza would recognize in the term Anthropocene, just the sort of absolute development and extension and explosion of that way of thinking. Um, and he, he would, I think, recognize the notion that that we we think of our, we think of ourselves as living in an era that's entirely human determined. Now that idea in itself is 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 wrong on one level mm. because again nature is nature. Nature isn't only about human beings; it's about all kinds of other beings. Um, but at the same time, the human belief in in our own free will and our own centrality and our own all importance has kind of exploded to the extent that we we really have started to have an undue influence on all these other systems. Um, so yeah, it would be a really interesting discussion to have with Spinoza as to what he thinks yeah, yeah, about yeah. that concept and that, that way of kind of carving up time. But I, I do think he would he would be interested. Wonderful. Um, here's a question from Stephen Nadler. Um, uh, a related topic. Um, can you say something about whether you think we can use Spinoza to defend a more respectful treatment of non-human animals? So we've talked about the Anthropocene, humans. Um, what does Spinoza, or what might Spinoza say about um, should we treat animals better or no? Yeah, again, th thanks for that, and hello, Stephen. Um, yeah, I think this is a this is a really tricky one because again, there are these there are these passages in the ethics where Spinoza is, is just really clear that we we don't owe anything to non-human animals. Um, so, in a sense, that the interesting flip side of Spinoza's anti-anthropocentrism is is a really clear humanism in Spinoza, interestingly, and that humanism relates to Spinoza's political thinking and his ethical thinking. So he sort of relates to what we were talking about earlier. He, he thinks that, that what it is to be a human being in the best possible way is, is really to understand human essence and what's good for human beings and what's how we come together as human rational thinkers and, and build on that kind of knowledge. Um, and in, in that regard, animals for him are really irrelevant. They, they just can't mm. enter into that. We can't think mm. rationally with, with cats and dogs and dolphins and chimpanzees. Mm. We can't bring them into our political communities. Um, and and he also thinks that you know feeling emotions for animals, feeling pity for them, or feeling you know sorry for them, or or even loving them is not the appropriate response. Um, on the other hand, <laughs> I, again, I like to think that you know if Spinoza were with us today, he'd be sort of big enough to to change his views based on, on, on sort <laughs> so of updating Spinoza all the time, we have <laughs> and, and sort of understanding how not only how similar we are to, to some other animals, but how essential they are to our being and our flourishing. Mm -hmm. and, okay. and I do think that that if he had that kind of knowledge, he might well take a different view about what we owe to animals. I'm not saying he would necessarily think that we can bring um, non-human animals into our political communities 
although mm, okay. it's a good question whether we could. Um, but but certainly that that ethically, because it's good for us that we preserve non-human animals, um, it, it, it it's ethically right that we treat them with more respect than mm. we have done. So could we see this a bit as um, the ex expansion of the human perspective that we talked about earlier? So you might initially just think about yourself short term and then you think, oh, but actually there's my family and there's yeah. animals somewhere along the way. That's right. As, as we sort yeah. of build out from our own perspective and we start to understand our connections more and more, um, our ethical horizons broaden and, um, yeah. and, and, and take in those other kinds of beings and, and, and maybe even further. I mean, you know, we're understanding more and more about trees and how, how trees yeah. are, are actually an essential interconnected part of, of yeah. you know, webs and, um, and ecosystems. So, yeah. Perfect. Um, here's a question from Kay Sidebottom, um, who asked, given your view of Spinoza, how would you change um, education, particularly in schools, about climate and environmental issues? So what might a Spinozan education system look like? So that really ties in with the, to the what we discussed earlier about increasing your rational insight into the situation. How does education, how, how would Spinoza see education feature in there? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So I think I think one thing that he would think was important was to divorce the discussion of climate change from emotional responses to it. So so often um, climate change discussions are are clouded in feelings of guilt, um, feelings of fear, um, feelings of panic, sometimes feelings of hope. Um, Again, you know, we talked about this earlier, but if, if we if that's our starting point, it's fine. But if that's the only response that we mm, have, mm -hmm. um, it's not it's not going to get us anywhere. So, from an educational perspective, I think what matters to Spinoza is to to build children into adults who are who are really good thinkers, yeah. and who are not just good at thinking, but who are good at working together with other good thinkers. Um, you know, not not just in their own yeah. communities, but but internationally. Um, so. So it's important to build not only knowledge, but the ability to share knowledge um, between, yeah. between groups. But something else that I want to come back to is, is this notion of narratives and stories. Mm. Um, and I think that that might also be a way in which Spinoza would advocate um, educating not only children, but adults as well. Um, so just to give a little bit of background on this, um, yeah. early modern philosophers like Spinoza, but also Hobbes and Locke, um, they use the story of the social contract to explain why human beings should give up their right to dominate one another and why they should commit to the civil state and obey its laws. Mm -hmm. That's a really common narrative in the early modern period. And Spinoza, like many of these thinkers, is really upfront. This is a story, right? This isn't history. This is just a story that we tell ourselves to, to justify why we think it's right that we, we don't just, you know, dominate each other and, and, uh, and kill each other in you know in the state of nature. Um, one suggestion is that maybe what we need is a new story of that kind, and I, I like to think that mm. Spinoza might be sympathetic to this. A story about why we should give up our right to dominate nature. Maybe that's what we need—a new kind of social contract narrative, but it's like a, a natural contract. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. We have to give up our right to dominate nature. We need to understand and acknowledge that we're part of a community of all of nature. And we need to understand why it's in our interest to act in the interests of nature as a whole. Um, now, I don't know what that story is, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I think Spinoza would, would be interested in the power of, of stories and narratives. Yeah. Um, and, and we can think of lots of different ways in which that might work through, through literature, through museums, through right. theater, um, maybe through groups like Extinction Rebellion to some mm -hmm. extent, but, but, yeah. but through the arts especially. Mm. And this could be something that, I mean, thinking practically, where um, I'm not sure what that's the appropriate point, but um, this is something that people inspired by Spinoza could take up at this point and try to develop those narratives and see how, yeah, what they could look like. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, really fun. Um, I have a related question. Um, uh, by Alice Simoniato, uh, who asks, uh, in your um, uh, in our original conversation, uh, you often use the term rational understanding. If you could clarify, uh, what is this rational understanding for Spinoza? Mm. 
yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So very briefly, and we could talk about this almost all evening, but it's been, it's been <laughs> another, another yeah. thing that there are three ways in which we can know the world. Um, the first is what he calls imagination. That's that inadequate way of knowing that I touched on earlier. So yeah. when we when we know just through experience, the bits and pieces we pick up, feelings, um, you know, the sort of haphazard knowledge that we get from the world and from the people around us. Um, what we aim to do for Spinoza is to, to build that into rational knowledge. And rational knowledge is true knowledge, it's adequate knowledge, and it's based on um, deductive arguments to some extent, but, but we don't always think in terms of deductive arguments, mm -hmm. of course. Um, sometimes it's just about hitting on one really solid fact, something that we can know okay. is true. Um, it's what Descartes, for example, calls clear and distinct knowledge. So we can, you know, we can we can focus on one one little piece of knowledge, and from that little piece of knowledge, we can we can deduce um, more knowledge. So, you know, for example, Spinoza thinks um, uh, the the claim that all bodies are extended is a kind of a you know that's a piece of rational knowledge, and and from that we can understand lots of things about the geometry and the physics of bodies, for for instance. Um, so so rational knowledge is you know, very simple answer, it's true knowledge. Um, slightly more complicated answer is, is that it's knowledge that picks up on and builds on our empirical knowledge to, to be yeah. able to form productive arguments. Um, and the third kind of knowledge, intuition, we maybe won't touch on. That, that's when we get into that way of knowing from God's perspective, from the eternal perspective. And that's right. something that Spinoza thinks that we're, we're sort of building up as we go along. It's, it's kind of, we're getting better and better at it as we right. um, more rational thinkers. But more difficult to achieve for mere mortals. Yeah, yeah. And more difficult to explain as well. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good. Um, uh, then we move to another question. So here's a question by Elise Jones, who asks, what would Spinoza think of the Gaia hypothesis? And I know you have some ideas about this. Yeah, um, so, so reading James Lovelock and thinking about the Gaia hypothesis really, really chimed with Spinoza for me. Um, I'm not familiar with with all of the details of it, um, but from what I've read, it seems to me that Spinoza would would absolutely agree with with that view. Indeed, what 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 Lovelock calls Gaia is just what Spinoza calls God or nature. Now there are some differences. Um, I think that Gaia for Lovelock is is restricted to the Earth. So Gaia is is the, the whole the whole living system of the Earth. It doesn't extend beyond the Earth. For Spinoza. God or nature is um, is infinite, and it, it so it extends to the whole of the infinite universe. And indeed, if there are other universes and other dimensions and, and other ways of being than the ones we know, it extends to those as well. So it so it's this, Spinoza's concept is metaphysically bigger, but I think that ultimately the the idea is uh, is very much in tune. Um, and uh, there was a related question: Does would Spinoza think of, um, also by Elise Jones, does uh, Spinoza think of ecosystems or groups of organisms as having some sort of striving to preserve themselves, or is that really the um, just the individual being? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't, I don't really know the answer to that one. Um, okay. So in the in the mid to late 17th century, when Spinoza is writing, the the concept of the organic and the ecosystem just doesn't really exist yet. That that kind of thinking is just getting going. Um, so Spinoza is kind of caught between the old Aristotelian way of, of thinking about species as having as kind of sharing an essence and, um, and, and these really new scientifically determined ways of, of thinking about species, which, which, are, which he, he doesn't know mm -hmm. about yet. Um, so I, I waver a little bit on this question. Sometimes I think that Spinoza does think that there are species and that, and that we can know certain things about them and that they have things in common and that, you know, we can, we can sort of classify them in that way. And thus we can think of systems of species as, as, as working together and so on. At other times, I, I, I'm not sure that he does have that concept and, and really think that he's just talking about individuals. This is actually a big, a big issue in Spinoza studies. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to play it safe and stay agnostic on this question for now. But it, but I, I do think it's a very interesting question to pose of, of, of someone writing at the time that Spinoza is writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Um, here is a question um, by Stephen Reed, uh, who asks, who observes that climate change can be a, a driver of mass migration. Um, what do you, how do you think Spinoza would respond to uh, the political challenges that this presents? Um, so 
potential rise of conflicts. Um, so that probably ties in with what we uh, talked about towards the end on um, the political organization. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. So, so the social and political emergencies yeah. that are going to be caused by by the climate crisis would, for Spinoza, be absolutely probably the most worrying thing. Mm -hmm. um, again, I mean, Spinoza lived at a time of, of political precarity. Um, he, he, I'd say, he understands what it what it means for your whole society to, to, to sort of erupt. And 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 of course, as a a child of migrant parents, he also understands what what immigration means and forced immigration in particular, what that means. Um, so Spinoza would be very, very worried about those political crises okay. that are on the horizon. And, and that's that's one reason why we, we need to strive to, to stop those things happening. <laughs> um, we need to strive for for stability. That's that's part of what it means. Peace and stability are part of what it means to live a good human yeah. life. So what's good for us is whatever will bring peace and stability. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean preserving the status quo. And in many places, it, it doesn't mean that, but it, it does mean avoiding those kinds of catastrophic events, which which will definitely cause strife, conflict, and and, uh, and you know political difficulties. Mm -hmm. cool. um, here's another question. They keep coming. <laughs> there are very many questions. Here's one by uh, Paige Colton, who asks: Given that we are all the same entity. What might Spinoza, Spinoza say about how we handle uh, conflicting approaches uh, on the climate uh, crisis? So if we're all the same entity, then um, is any approach just as natural, justifiable as a competing approach? Yeah. So if it's all the same being, how can it be that we differ in what we think about what to do about yeah. um, the climate emergency? So like, did you mean different different human perspectives on what we I think should that's, do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So conflicting approaches. So yeah. I say we should do this, and then the other says we should do uh -huh. that, and then yeah. So this is where where Spinoza's rationalism really kicks in, and you know people maybe won't like this answer, but you know Spinoza thinks there is a right answer here. <laughs> um, there is there is a, a true right answer to the question of what is good for us. And it's our job as human beings, well, not our job, but it's our, you know, it's, it's what's good for us as human beings is to figure mm -hmm. out the answer to that question. And figuring out the answer to that question is not easy. Uh, it's difficult. It, it requires us to, to think, to try to think as rationally as we can, to try to come together with others who think rationally and, and to try to work that out. So, um, so Spinoza thinks that disagreement is natural. And indeed, it's probably essential because without yeah. it, we don't really figure out um, the truth of the matter. Mm -hmm. But there is a truth of the matter, <laughs> and okay. um, and we'll reach it eventually by by sort of working things out. Now, in the in the current circumstances, we have very little time, <laughs> and you know, to 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 deal with climate change um, and to and to try to avert absolute catastrophe. I mean, maybe, maybe it's even too late. Mm -hmm. So, in that case, what do we do about the about the differing views and the different opinions? We have to act very quickly. Um, we maybe don't have time to have those debates mm -hmm. and those. Like, Discussions about about what's really best for us, um, and that makes things very difficult. We we have to we have to you know I guess Spinoza would say we, we have to try to get together the most the most rational minds that we have, the people who have mm -hmm. the best understanding of 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 you know what's going on and, and what could yeah. work, and we need we need to try to try to to work on those things. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is what you'll see Greta Thunberg, for example, insist on all the time as well. We don't have time for inaction or just. Yeah. yeah, disputing. Um, thank you. Uh, so here's a question from Swithin Thomas, who asks, is God or nature immortal or indestructible? And how does that um, tie in with our experience? So yep. is, is God, that indestructible? God or, God or nature is eternal and infinite for Spinoza. So whatever happens with the climate crisis, whatever happens mm. to planet Earth, okay. nature will go on <laughs> in some form or other. It won't, won't necessarily be the form that we recognize right now, but it will go on. That's Spinoza's view. I mean, you know, this, this may not this may not be in line with, with the current science, but that's his metaphysical view is that God and nature will, will always be there. Okay, so that's, yeah, we might uh, vanish, but uh, the nature will be there. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, here's a question from Peter Schuster Hughes, um, who asks, do you, uh, believe that Spinoza's um, variety of panpsychism um, might bolster an ecological mindset. So I think the term panpsychism 
Hmm. You may not have dropped the term, but that's uh, in the background here. Yeah. Um, so I'll maybe just quickly explain that. Yeah. Term, maybe I'm familiar. Um, yeah. So Spinoza is um, what's usually called a parallelist about the about the mind and the body. Okay. And what that what that means is that the mind and the body are the same thing. Um, understood in two different ways. <laughs> so we can think of the mind and the body as being identical to each other, we can think of them as being equal to each other, um, or we can think of them as being parallel to each other. But in any case, there's no dualism here. Spinoza, the mind and the body are, are the same thing, kind of understood from two different perspectives, two sides of the same coin, if you like. Now, um, attached to that view is the view that every body has an idea that's associated with it, and that idea can be understood as a mind. So this comes very close to at least some versions of panpsychism, which is the view that consciousness is um, mm -hmm. distributed everywhere in the universe. Maybe it's distributed more, uh, more strongly in some ways than in others, um, but, but effectively that, that minds and consciousness are, are not just restricted to the human brain, but, but that, they're, that they're everywhere. So, on one reading, Spinoza thinks that all, all beings have minds of some kind. Maybe they don't all have minds that are as complex as the human mind, but, but all, all, every body that exists has some kind of mind um, attached to it. So can that help us to develop a more ecological perspective? Um, mm -hmm. Yes, I think it can. I mean, I mean again, this goes along with, um, with increasing our understanding of ourselves and of our place in in the universe part of part of understanding ourselves and our understanding our connections to everything else is understanding that we are not as unique as we think we are we we are not these you know god chosen beings who are the purpose of the universe we're just we're just one one other kind of being among others the other beings are probably more like us than we think and they're more like us than we think, be, in, in, at least in the sense that, that they probably have minds of some kind. So once we start to understand that, um, hopefully that also increases our understanding of, uh, you know, those kinds of ethical questions that we touched on earlier. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, and I think we have time for one more related question. So here's a question from Anne Hutchison, uh, who asks um, if you can identify possible influences from Spinoza's concept of the unity of nature, um, which resembles pantheism or panentheism and um, eco uh, theory, uh, e ecological theory, eco theology. So, do you know if there's influence um, from contemporary eco theories uh, and uh, uh, Spinoza? Sorry, I think I misunderstood the question. So is there a connection between eco-theology? I'm going, and... yeah, let me read it very literally. Can you identify possible influences for Spinoza's concept of the unity of God nature, which resemble pantheism or panentheism, and eco-theology, which is a newer construct? Um, I don't think I can, and that's only because of my own ignorance. So I, I think I would put that question back to you or to anyone else who, okay. who knows about eco-theology. It, it's not something I know anything about. It sounds really interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd love to hear more about um, about whether pantheism and panentheism mm -hmm. has has kind of contemporary resonance yeah. with those kinds. Right. Of I mean, I suspect it does. I mean, I, one thing that I've learned from you know, 15 years of working on Spinoza is that um, there's all kinds of resonances with Spinoza, yeah. theory, all kinds of um, belief systems, but but also theories and ways of thinking that that one doesn't necessarily anticipate. And, mm. and so, um, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if there are resonances there as well. Wonderful. Um, so, and not only have we seen that from Spinoza, there are most likely resonances with all kinds of contemporary thinking, but we also have seen that um, Spinoza can help us think about how to respond emotionally to the current climate emergency. So don't despair, don't panic, or if you do only use it instrumentally to spur people into action. Um, it's been so wonderful to have this conversation with you. Um, thank you everyone who participated and everyone whose questions we answered and everyone who asked questions we didn't get to because there were loads. I saw in the chat that there's loads of praise for the depth of knowledge that you've uh, give, shared with us. Um, uh, we've come to the end of our session, so... Um... Well, thank, thank you. I'll, I'll say thank you as well. So thank you, Chris, for your questions. They've, they've been great. And thank you, Anthony, for, for hosting me.
And thank you to everybody who, who tuned in and asked questions. If we didn't get to your question, please contact me on Twitter. I'm at Prof Beth Lord. Um, I'm easy to find and I'll, I'll try to answer questions there if possible, but it, it's been really, it's been really good. Thanks a lot. Yeah, um, just, just to repeat those sentiments. Thank you both for a really great um, discussion. It's always frustrating. I can never really pay much attention because I'm sort of in the background. <laughs> and, I, busy. Sort of, I always get a sort of feeling about how it's all gone. I really felt tonight was excellent. So thank you both so much. And um, yeah, that, that's that's really about it. This is the last um, event in the Cafe Culture series for autumn. The philosopher, which is partnering with Cafe Culture on the philosophy event, still has two more dates. Um, on Monday, there's an event featuring Amy Allen and Ava von Reidecker, which will be discussing um, critical theory in relation to psychoanalysis. And then on the 14th, we're having a bumper day on veganism and philosophy, which features two of the editorial board members of The Philosopher, Darren Chetty and Adam Ferner, who do an excellent podcast called Do You Even Vegan? And we are <laughs> coinciding the three events that day with the three meals, at least if you live in England. So one's at 8 a.m., one's at 2 p.m., and one's at 7 p.m. So um, just type The Philosopher into Google if you want to find out more. So I think that's everything. Thanks so much to both Beth and Chris and um, yeah, thank you. I really hope everyone enjoyed it as much as I did. So good. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye.